When we catch sight of the totality of God's claim on our lives, our believing wavers. When we hear the absurdity of God's unbreakable covenant with us, like Sarah and Abraham, we laugh. When we face the foolish wisdom of the looming cross, like Peter, we suggest an alternative. Meet us in our disbelieving, loving God. Move us gently into the deep waters of faith. Let us worship you now in spirit and in truth. Join us in worship at DisciplesNet. Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of Mark. And it's important to know what's gone on just before we start reading. It's one of the disciple Peter's most shining moments where Jesus has asked him, who do people say that I am? And then Jesus asks a closer question, who do you say that I am? Peter answers back, you are the Messiah, the great confession as we call it, the right answer of all time. Peter got it. But then his bubble is about to burst. And let's listen to that as Janet reads. Reading from Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and with, for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I'm going 
going to build our prayer around a spiritual that is sung often at church camps here in the United States. And the spiritual is kumbaya, come by here. The word kumbaya comes from the Gula people, who are a people who live along the coast in southeastern United States. And they've lived in a somewhat isolated condition for a long time and developed their own language. Join me now as we pray in the spirit of this lovely, lovely song. Holy God, kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya, come by here. We are lost and wandering people, Lord. We need you to sit with us for a while so we can share our sorrows and our joys with you. Be present with us now as we offer our stories to you. Someone's crying, Lord. Kumbaya. It's a hard and troubled life for many of us, Lord. There are wars all around this little world of ours, and people are dying by the thousands. Hear the cries of the ones who are frightened, homeless, anguished because of the loss of loved ones, homes, and homelands. For the sick, bring them healing in their hearts if it's not possible to fix their bodies. For the sad and lonely, be that friend who holds their hand when nobody else is there. For the little ones who cry from hunger, please find a way for the rest of us to get them some food. Come by here. Someone's laughing, Lord, kumbaya. There's some of us who are finding joy all around. New life, new beginnings, new hope, new faith. Laugh with us, Lord, and help us hold the precious memories in our hearts forever so the memories can nourish us when the hard times come for these special times when we are so happy to be alive. We give you all the thanks that we have. Someone's praying, Lord, kumbaya. Lord, teach us to settle down a bit and listen to the wisdom and peace you will offer us. In our busy lives, make us find time to be centered and quiet so that we can hear you. And please remind us to be especially grateful for the beautiful images, sounds, and thoughts you send us in those moments when we pause to seek you. We need you, Lord, kumbaya. In our darkest hours, in our finest hours, in peace, in war, in love, in fear, in waking, in sleeping, in all that we do, Lord, walk with us. Watch over us. Stay behind us to protect us. Stay before us to lead us. Hold us up lest we fall. Shine above us to raise our spirits. And always, always take the hand that we stretch out to you for strength. We ask these things in the name of the one who taught us how to say, Kumbaya, come by here. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts. Soul never dies 
it shines to light the shores of home where the soul never dies. No sad farewells, no tear dim dies. Where all is love and the soul never dies. have played or heard about a children's game that's called King of the Mountain or King of the Hill. It's a very simple game. All the child needs to do is find some kind of hill, a dirt hill, or even a piece of furniture in the house will do if parents aren't around. Climb up to the top and declare, I'm King of the Mountain. The other children's job, if they wish to play, is to try to knock that child off the mountain so they can get up top. Sometimes it's just gentle pushing that's used, but sometimes it's all out hitting and roughness and viciousness where bones and teeth are broken and children end up bloodied and bruised. There's even a video going around on YouTube of goats seeming to play a similar game on a band of metal in their yard. Now, King of the Mountain is what game theorists call a zero-sum game. And what that means is for someone to win, to make it up the mountain, someone else has to lose to be down the mountain. And when the game is over and all the scores are tallied up, the negatives and the positives, the net sum is zero. Now, what do children and goats on a hill have to do with this scripture? I think there's plenty, and I'd like to use the image of the hill as a metaphor today to what Jesus is talking about. Now, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be on top of the world, except for when that place is exclusively reserved for ourselves and people that look like us and our opinions. Let's go back to our scripture. Remember when Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? And he answers, you are the Messiah. Some translations call this the anointed one of God. In Greek, Messiah is translated for Christos, which becomes Christ in English. Jesus was the Christ and Peter got it. But keep in mind, Peter is not the only one who makes this great confession. Throughout history, each person who chooses to believe in and follow Jesus makes it in some form or other. You may have made it. You may be thinking about making it someday. But realize that even at the best of himself, Peter was incomplete in his understanding that day of Jesus and even at the end of his life. And that's how we all are. When we commit our life to following Jesus, to being a disciple, it's just the starting place, that confession of our belief. And in it, Jesus says, do not be ashamed, be bold. Our passage, though, covers what comes next as we choose to live a life for Christ, to live a life that God would have us to live. Look at poor Peter who came from his wounding moment to being rebuked as he took Jesus aside and said, Jesus, out of love and concern probably, don't be talking like that. You're not going to die. We won't let it happen. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You see, Peter's words were so close to the very ones that Jesus had already dealt with when he was being tempted in the desert. Satan had tempted him, promising him a path of ease, a life of luxury and glory. Jesus could rule high from a throne where his power would insulate him from his own pain and discomfort and from the problems of the world. But Jesus had turned that kind of life down. He refused to be elevated to that kind of hill, that kind of throne. 
Instead, he would serve on his knees, washing his disciples' feet as a servant would. He would hang out with people who were diseased and dirty and difficult. He would love them as they were in all their imperfection. He would give his life for them and teach his disciples to do the same. So Jesus takes this moment with Peter to be a teachable moment. He turns from Peter to include the other disciples in the larger group and teaches, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now, it's important here to note that denying ourselves doesn't mean seeing our life as cheap or throwing it away. Far from that. Life is precious. It's a treasure, a gift that God has given each person alive. In addition to what God has given, think of the gifts that each person carries within them, the gifts that others have given to them, big and small, over a lifetime. Yes, some have been given more than others, but we all have them. Each one's life matters before God. And that's why when we make sacrifices of ourselves, even our lives, it means something. Jesus seems to be speaking of denying our lives in a little bit of a way like a parent does, a good parent, with their children day in and day out. A refugee mother denies her own need for food and her clothing, giving her share to her children to make sure they will live. A father desperately in need of sleep for an important task the next day, nevertheless sits up all night with a sick child. Denying ourselves means seeing the bigger picture, to see life that goes on beyond the problems of the moment, to see the world out there, and that our choices make a difference in the world and in the lives of others. Jesus has more to say. He says, for those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose it for my sake and the sake of the gospel will save it. If we use the metaphor of two hills here, perhaps the message is that if you die on your own hill, you're going to die alone. Turned inward, you lose the chance to participate in this world and the kingdom of heaven, which includes the others around you. You forfeit the greatest of all gifts, the gifts of knowing what it's like to share God's love with the world, of knowing grace, forgiveness, and harmony of the soul's first hand. We're being asked to climb down from that personal position that personal position of power, ease, and comfort. We're being asked to climb down from any hills from where only ourselves, only our kind, are at the top. And we can't see, can't be bothered by, can't be touched by others. Where any others we see below us are less than we are, maybe even less than human. We're being asked to climb another hill, this one in humility, taking up our cross, willing to bear some of the weight of the world as Jesus did. We can't do it alone, but together the body of Christ can. If you die at Christ's side, you can be sure you do not die alone. And face it, no matter who we are, how much power or wealth or health or wisdom we have, we'll all die someday from our earthly selves. Sometimes new Christians want to know, does this mean I need to start packing for some distant land and put myself in harm's way where I'm sure to be killed as a martyr? I don't have any answers for anyone but myself, but I do know that this is a little bit of a different culture than the disciples that Jesus was speaking to then. But if you feel God calling you to a distant land, you should look at this call prayerfully. What we need to realize is that God's work is going on around each of us where we are right now, and there's great need there too. And we make up the body of Christ, each of us, and the stronger the parts are, the stronger the whole will be to handle the problems of the world. It starts where you are right now. We're prone to notice when people die giving the ultimate sacrifice. Jesus is known for dying on the cross, speaking those words of forgiveness and love. Yet few consider that Jesus' death on the cross was merely a punctuation of the way he gave of himself throughout his life. Living in God's love must be a daily work. One of the many families who seemed to get the big picture of what Jesus was talking about here lived in Holland, the Netherlands, in the early This was the Casper ten Boom family of Harlan and Amsterdam. They worked each day to help the world beyond themselves. They were faithful in their church. Casper led in setting up organizations to help the poor of town and they took in countless foster children into their home. Corey, Casper's daughter, led a special church service for children and adults with disabilities for 20 years. Yes, the Tin Boom's everyday faithfulness would have been remarkable enough alone. 
But have you noticed those who have been steadfastly faithful in serving God in small things stand ready to serve when crisis comes? And it did come for the ten booms with World War II and the Nazi occupation of Holland. As the Jews were being rounded up and sent to concentration camps, the ten booms began secretly hiding in their home, the Jews and others whose lives were in danger. When asked if he knew that he could die for helping the Jews, Casper replied, it would be an honor to give my life for God's chosen people. Their hiding place worked for almost two years until February the 28th, 1944, 71 years ago, when the Gustavo raided the home. They arrested Casper, his three daughters, son, nephew, and others around the house. Overall, about 30 were taken to prison. Now, Casper was 84 years old and in very poor health. And when the Gestapo offered to let him go home and die in his own bed, he replied, If I go home today, tomorrow I'll open my door to anyone who knocks for help. He lived 10 days in prison and died on March the 10th. His daughter Betsy and other family members died in prison or of their stay there. Yet daughter Koi Ten Boom miraculously lived and traveled the world for decades telling their story afterwards. Her books, such as The Hiding Place and Tramp for the Lord, are translated into many languages. Some of us are called to make that ultimate sacrifice. For others, it's a life of little sacrifices, and for some, it's both. But living as God's people means a lifetime of seeing the big picture of God and all of God's people, however long that may be. My prayer for you today is that when that time comes, you may look around and see yourself on a great mountain, not of your own making or taking, but in company with the other saints of God. There is great irony in Jesus saying that those who save their lives will lose them. Those who give up their lives will save them. The ultimate irony, perhaps, of the Christian faith is what it means to come to this table. The sacrifice of Jesus giving up his life for us. And it is precisely in that 
that the promises of eternal life are fulfilled and made real for us. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious, loving Lord, we come here to you. We ask that you come here to us. Come by here to us, O God. In these moments of receiving the bread and the wine, these moments of receiving the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, may we truly be infused with your Holy Spirit as we eat and as we drink. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. And in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us come to Christ's table. My friends, go now into the world looking with God's vision of the eternity before us, of the richness of God's people all around us, and loving and serving alongside with the grace of God freely given for us all. And in giving, may you find your life here on earth and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>